Alice, would, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hello. So I'm a lecturer in the School of Health and Social Care, um, and I'm also a nurse by background. Incidentally, Helen was one of my mentors when I was a student nurse. Um, so uh, a big clap to Helen. Um, so thank you so much. <laughs> mentor as well and I've been a qualified nurse for about 11 years and I joined the university about three and a half years ago um, so thank you so much for inviting me to speak what a marvellous concept this is and this is the first time I've attended one of these pedagogy and pancakes um, online seminars if we can call it that um, so I wasn't really sure what to uh, present. So I, I decided to go with something that you could potentially take away, even if it's just an idea. Um, and I appreciate when I say the terms problem based learning, some people ask what on earth are you talking about? And for some, they go, oh, no, I wouldn't use PBL. So if you are thinking about how you're going to approach a curriculum design or you're thinking about how you could potentially consider changing your teaching or your facilitation if, if that's something you're wanting to do then I would potentially give PBL a, a bit of a, a try if you feel confident to do so. So um, I'm going to just share my screen um, now I do do some PBL orientation training so I've extracted quite a lot of these slides from that um, PowerPoint um, but if you do want to know more um, I will just pop my email account into the chat and um, I would welcome um, any contacts or, or I'm, I'm willing to provide any feedback in terms of PBL or advice and support. Incidentally, I'm also doing a PhD on PBL in nurse education. OK, so um, without further ado, hopefully you should be able to see my screen. Um, if you do decide to raise your hand, for some reason I can't see it when I'm sharing my screen, so I'd recommend just asking any questions or adding any commentary into the chat. OK, so um, yes, as I mentioned, I'm a lecturer in the School of Health and Social Care. And um, have a think about PBL if you're wondering how to con potentially um, consider your teaching approaches. OK, so I appreciate that I'm teaching grandma. <laughs> here but let's just think about what we really mean by pedagogy okay so this is the interactions between teachers students the learning environment and the learning tasks and I think of pedagogy as somewhat a curriculum so on one side you've got your teacher centered um, approaches which typically tend to be your lecture type approaches where as a lecturer you are the expert in the room and you are transmitting knowledge passively to your, um, your, your learners, sorry, are passively learning from your knowledge, okay. Tended to be very popular in the Victorian era, although we still do use lectures today. Um, PBL is at the other end of the spectrum, okay. We're looking very much at a learner-centred approach. OK, now from a theoretical viewpoint, it is very much student centred. Now, if you are facilitating PBL and I say the term facilitating because you're not teaching the students, you are enabling the students to develop the knowledge themselves. OK, so um, it enables students to work cooperatively in small groups. Groups tend to be between five and eight and they seek solutions to situations and, and problems. OK, now, as known today, um, it originates from McMaster School of Medicine, although there is controversy in the literature around who actually originated with PBL. Um, but it, it originally stimulated from dissatisfaction in medical education practices and that actually lecturing, it favours students who can memorise information but it may not mean that that person when they enter the workforce can actually assimilate and apply that knowledge, arguably. OK, I'm trying to keep a neutral stance here. <laughs> um, but actually, if you give students a case that's realistic, they could work through the problems associated with that case, go off, do some independent study and then present back what they've learned to peers within a small group. And that is essentially how PBL works. Now, admittedly, definitions of PBL are very ambiguous. Depends on, firstly, where the PBL is being rolled out. 
cultural differences play a big part here. Um, certainly within the literature, when you look at Confucian heritage cultures, PBL differs vastly compared to the Western world. And, and that's partly because of that cultural upbringing. Um, there is a power differential with the expert in the room there. And um, so it is worth just bearing that in mind when you are thinking about ro rolling this out. But ultimately, from a theoretical point of view, PBL is considering learning following the process of working towards the understanding of a problem. OK. So from a philosophical point of view, it's very much a social constructivist approach. Now, I'm a social scientist, so I feel quite comfortable with this sort of approach. OK, but I am conscious that um, for the positivists of us out there, um, this may feel quite uncomfortable. OK, so constructivism is that knowledge is conceived as a social construction created by individual learners as they attempt to make sense of the world. OK, whereas the lecture, the typical lecture where you've got an expert passing information over to passive students is very much a positivist stance. OK, and PBL has uh, is generally based on ideas that originated much earlier than the 1960s um, and have been nurtured by different um, researchers. So we've got Bruner, Dewey, Piaget, Rogers and of course Vygotsky, for those of you that um, are familiar with, with these philosophers and um, in education. Now, Barrows's model, who was one of the originators from Canada, um, consider four core characteristics of PBL. So essentially the learning should always be student centred. It has to occur in small student groups. When you get to a group size larger than nine, it becomes unwieldy. Um, everyone's fighting to have their bit of time to feed back. So I would recommend keeping groups quite small, but equally if you go under a size of Five, it becomes challenging again for its own independent reasons, as you may find that not actually sharing information. The tutor, the facilitator or a guide. This is the bit that often um, teachers who have perhaps been teaching for some time may struggle with. Um, now, I'm only drawing from my own lived experience there, but um, certainly we a couple of years ago, um, Aidan Jayant from the medical school and I, we incorporated PBL into an undergraduate skills based nursing module and we've carried out a piece of evaluative research. Um, it was definitely a learning journey for us all. Um, we did a multi method study whereby um, we did a cohort questionnaire, which was exploring the satisfaction around PBL comparatively to previous uh, modules that they'd had that had been a little bit more didactic. And then we did some focus groups exploring the students lived experiences of the PBL. And it was quite fascinating. Actually, we didn't realise that even between us as a module team, there were massive inconsistencies between how we facilitated. Um, and some of the most experienced academics and teachers sometimes struggle to release the control. OK, because everything has to come from the student. As a facilitator, you're just trying to stimulate discussions, pose a few reflective questions. But you also have to acknowledge that students can go wrong with this and you have to let them go wrong because they will learn from that mistake. And ultimately, it isn't real practice, hopefully in this context, um, when you are using it. Um, so you may not necessarily need to intervene but when you come to the end, you can go through a period of debrief to um, potentially mop up any issues. OK, so authentic problems are primarily encountered in the learning sequence before any preparation or study has occurred. OK, problems are encountered are used as a tool to achieve the required knowledge and the problem solving skills necessary to eventually solve the problem. And finally, new information needs to be acquired through self-direct learning. OK. So um, I appreciate that that's quite synthetic looking at that at the moment. You might want to actually explore an example of a trigger text to help you to gain some concept of what this is in terms of, of PBL. So I'm just going to try and share my screen onto a different um, document.
So in front of you now, you should be able to see a um, publication. And this uh, Gibson et al are talking here about the use of problem based learning in a district nursing um, programme. And this is an example of a typical trigger text. So you are visiting missing Miss, Mrs. Alice McDonald in her home. She is an 86 year old woman who requires a blood test for an INR, a morning blood glucose measurement, so on and so forth. Now I'm not gonna read the entire trigger text, but essentially you give the students a case and they work together to explore what the problems are associated with that case. Now you may have a learner that has no idea what an INR is. OK, or it might be that they don't feel too comfortable with the concept of AF. So then within that PBL team, that small group, that individual may go away and look up AF while the other individual looks at INR. Through a process of independent study, they find out everything they can about within that time frame about that particular topic area. They may present back a game to teach others about what INR means, or they may just provide a presentation. There's lots of ways you can play with this. And certainly um, a, a couple of years ago, as part of a teaching and innovation fund, I um, visited the University of Nottingham's graduate entry medical programme that use a PBL curriculum for the first two years. And it was a valid insight because students were really engaged and really able to produce different ways to teach one another. And um, as a facilitator, if you've got a really highly functioning team that are really engaged, you can really stand back. And I think it's really useful for these students to be able to teach one another, particularly within medicine when they're going out into practice and they're likely to need to support medical students and other members of staff within the workforce. OK, so I'm just going to head back to my um, PowerPoint. OK, so um, if you decide, you know what, this sounds like it might be useful um, within your teaching. I do hear a word of caution. Um, if it is so great, and why is it not more popular? OK, I have to be discursive with what I'm saying here. And in truth, in the 19, uh, late 1990s, a number of studies were rolled out. Um, Calivia is, is, is one in particular who found no convincing evidence for effectiveness of PBL compared to traditional approaches. OK, and um, PBL was also linked to lower basic science exam scores and more hours of study. And in truth, one of the things we have found with our nursing students is those students that are really highly engaged um, and perform very well, generally speaking, across the programme tend to really value PBL and enjoy it. Whereas some of the students who may struggle or may be more strategic in their learning sometimes feel that there's a lot of work that you do within PBL that is not necessarily linked to the assessment or they may not necessarily see the advantage to it. So if you are going to utilise PBL, I would strongly recommend outlining your pedagogic stance as to why you are doing PBL and not delivering through a didactic means um, and there is other criticism here you know stated bluntly if PBL is, a sim is simply another route for achieving the same product why bother with the expense and effort of making a painful curriculum revision but I think we have to be pragmatic here and we have to really think about what we're trying to achieve personally as a nurse educator I want to help build and prepare nurses that are ready for the workforce that can solve problems independently and with others within the clinical environments. And PBL really nurtures that. And certainly within the literature, when they've looked at PBL within nurse education, some of the richest literature that we've got and evidence that we've found is actually with those that have already graduated, that have gone out into the workforce and then thought back on their training, if it's been a PBL curriculum and gone, actually, yes, that really did help because it provided me with the ability to problem solve and to be independent with searching for things. It also gives you the confidence to challenge others. You know, in nursing, sometimes there is this view that actually 
you should just do as the doctor tells you to do. But it's healthy, I think, to challenge sometimes and to look at the evidence independently and, and to generate that potential argument in practice if it's constructive. OK. Now, I'm conscious time is ticking on. You should, I imagine you're all very familiar with constructive alignment. But if you are developing a curriculum that is PBL, it is essential that the assessment is aligned. And you can actually as assess the PBL cycles themselves and the students' engagement if, if that's something you're wishing or willing to do. Certainly for our um, module on the nursing programme, we ask students to write an essay on one of the cases and one of the problems, and that worked really well to help engage students. Um, and again, there are different strategies to PBL, which is one of the challenges when it comes to researching it um, because of the amount of variables. But it's worth having a look at which strategy you want to utilise. So there's Maastricht, there's McMaster's as well, died over here. So, OK, so um, you might find this useful to take away. So this is a typical structure for PBL. So students are introduced to the case. OK, but also the principles of this pedagogy and um, they start to attempt to understand the problems and that might be multiple problems within one case. OK, then they need to report back to um, individuals within the group. And then they discuss their new knowledge, their emergent knowledge as they progress on. OK, and for us within our nursing programme, we heavily adapted that. And we, um, as we step forward to this next upcoming semester, we will be doing all of our PBL seminars online. OK, so we're going to hopefully use MS Teams and use private channels for the teams. And then they will still be coming into clinical skills teaching in the um, on a separate day to further discuss the case and apply some of the practical elements around skills acquisition. Um, we always give them an exacerbation halfway through a case, and I think that's quite typical of clinical practice. You can plan for a certain um, outcome, and it may not necessarily happen if the patient's condition deteriorates, and then they continue on through that cycle. OK. Um, my biggest word of advice, though, if it comes to rolling out PBL, is make sure that you prepare both the students and the staff. Um, and everything needs to be accessible um, in terms of the virtual learning environment. You may want to scaffold the learning if you are going to go with a more structured approach. It's also useful to mention at this point that there is a difference between case based learning, problem based learning, project based learning and context based learning. PBL is far less structured and it's really up to the students to generate their priorities in terms of the cases. OK, now I appreciate this is a massive topic and I'm running very close to the wire, so it might be useful at this point for me to stop presenting on this topic and open up um, the opportunity for questions. OK, thank you ever so much for listening. Muted myself. Uh, brilliant. Thank you very much. And uh, really, really interesting. Um, does anybody from the chat have any questions on problem based learning? And if so, just feel free to unmute yourself and uh, and just ask away. It does, to be fair, PBL does tend to be more popular in like the professional vocational programmes. So, um, you know, if, if you're teaching in, in law, um, medicine, nursing, um, agriculture, business, computing, it may fit the programme. But it might be that for some programmes, PBL is just is not possibly an option. But It's interesting, actually. So I did have one question myself. I mean, we've... Um... You actually you tend to see quite a bit of problem based learning in computer science, um, specifically around um, kind of response training. Um, yeah. You know, you, you set a scenario and, and, and let the students kind of um, explore that. Um, and it's interesting, I, I sometimes find actually the students are sometimes the ones who almost a little bit nervous around that because you're kind of giving them a lot of ownership like you know handing off a lot straight to them 
Um, yeah. And I don't always think that the education system up to this point always prepares them that well for that. Um, how have you overcome that, that transition? Well, this again was a bit of a learning curve because I, when we first started rolling out PBL, um, we thought, oh, they'll take to, like a duck to water. This will be fine. You know, I'm not going to worry too much. And I'd set them a few little tasks to do with LinkedIn. Well, I think it was lynda.com back then. Um, just have a look at the concept of PBL. But they would come into a, into a seminar room and they hadn't got a clue what they were doing, bless them. So we did have to strip it right back and say, look, imagine this is a real patient that you are looking at now. This is a real person. What are you going to do? Now, certainly my background's in district nursing, where we were very much on our own. And if you knocked on that door and, and you walked into somebody's house and they've collapsed on the floor, you have to solve that problem straight away. What are you going to do? How are you going to respond? Mm -hmm. So we did have to link it quite heavily to practice, which works well in nursing because 50 percent of the time students are in clinical practice. Um, so that's how we re-anchored it and we found as students got more confident they would contribute more and more but it was really challenging with shy students who perhaps didn't want to contribute or were nervous about feeding back but by the end of it the feedback was actually I feel a lot more comfortable now and I feel like I would be more comfortable to speak up and advocate for a patient in practice. Mm. Um, Equally, we did have the opposite happen where we got some students who felt like they were always the ones having to participate and um, it was almost painful that they they felt that oh, I'm always the one having to speak up and feedback. I'm always the one that has to outline the problems and take the lead. Um, so social loafing was also considered problematic. Um, this Absolutely is right. And there's some, some